Can I welcome you back to the second day of the conference? Um, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, bad luck. It was a fantastic day, and um, I'd just like to reflect on four things from yesterday um, that I'm taking away. The first and most important is the, pa the power of the People's Panel and the impact that's had on the conference and how we truly need to co-design um, the House of Care with people, not just for people. And I've been reminded that the person with long-term conditions needs to be the architect. And they, they, we need to be asking them what is the design they want. So we also need the tools to make the change happen. And some of you will have heard John Young's talk yesterday. There's been all the breakout sessions. We've had the posters. We've had presentations. Um, certainly, Peter Fondergy and I, when we set out on this journey together, um, uh, really, really weren't quite sure um, how this conference would land. But my feeling is that what I'm going to get is, 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 is look for and seek from you some product. And those of you who are here yesterday will remember that I talked about the, 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 the three groups um, that we deal with. There's the choir, which is here today, um, interested, engaged, involved, and willing to sing along. There are the statues, and um, <coughs> we'll leave them where they are. But there's the audience out there who are passively watching at the moment, not actively engaged. And somehow, we, we, and I need your help, need to get out there and mobilize the audience to actually participate, not be passive in the changes we require. Um, and the other thing is that I think we talked about long-term conditions and the changes that are being wrought. And a single condition focus has got us so far, probably as far as we can get with just having a single condition focus. And one of the things we need to work on is how do we create a system which takes complex comorbidity into account? And I'm extremely grateful that here today we've got Fiona Godley from the BMJ. <coughs> and I'm very lucky because I get the BMJ every week, shortly after my dog's got it. Um, so I'm really glad that the BMJ is also on an iPad. Um, and uh, it's Malcolm Grant and uh, Sir Bruce Keogh. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Fiona um, to uh, introduce them and the next session. So thank you very much for coming back. And I hope today you enjoy as much as yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, actually, I'm going to move there, if I may, because these people, I'm going to sit there. Is that all right? Okay. We'll have a seat here. <laughs> First of all, rearrange the furniture. Um, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I wasn't here yesterday, so um, it's always amazing to come to a meeting uh, with, you know, after a whole day that some of you have been at and feel the buzz and to um, really get a sense, as Cyril Chandler said to me just before we started this morning, um, that there's a real sense that this is a turning point. A lot of meetings say that, but there's a real sense that this is the critical mass, the right people are in the room, in this big building. We've got a people's panel, which is a really fantastic innovation. Um, someone told me that a, a senior American commentator said this is a really edgy meeting, which is always a good thing. And I think that, that's certainly the feeling I've already picked up from briefly um, being around this morning. So it's a real pleasure to chair this um, first panel uh, plenary session. So we're going to have, first of all, some words from Professor Sir Bruce Keogh, who, as you know, is the Medical Director of NHS England, and then from Professor Sir Malcolm Grant, who was, until recently, prof prof Provost of UCL Partners and is now uh, Chairman of NHS England. And then we're going to bring you in, um, hopefully leave enough time for a really good input from the People's Panel, and then uh, from you also. I'm not sure if you're statues or audience, but I think these guys are the choir. So um, let's hope we get a lot of interaction. So um, over to you, Bruce, to lead us in. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for putting aside the time to come to what's really quite an important conference. I looked at the title of the conference and saw it was Future of Health. I'd like you to think of it as something broader than that, and I'll explore this a little bit with you over the next couple of minutes. I think this is about the future of the NHS. 
I think it's about the future of where professionals sit in society, and I think the success of our endeavor over the next few months and years gets to the heart of the trust that the citizens of this country put in the NHS, in those who run it, and in those who deliver the services. So this is a really important meeting. If you were to cast your mind back a number of years to the war, Second World War, there will have been bombs dropping outside this building. There will have been questions asked about the quality of medical care that was being delivered to the combatants who were getting it free. And there were people saying if the combatants are getting it free and civilians are getting hit, then they should get free health care. And it was really that debate which led to the larger debate about why we should have an NHS which delivers uh, free health care. But it was part of a much bigger debate about changing society in general, about the provision of free health care, housing, education. The NHS was one component of that welfare state which emerged round about the late 1940s. And in particular, the legislation that gave rise to the NHS came out in 1948. So just imagine the debates that were going on around this just after the war, 1946, 1947. 1947, times were hard. There'd been the worst floods for 53 years, one of the coldest winters that Europe had seen. That resulted in a delaying of the sowing of the, of the crops, which meant that there was a food shortage, it meant the price of foodstuffs were up, the bacon ration was halved, the meat ration was halved, the bread ration was halved, and potatoes were rationed for the first time. It was worse than it had ever been during the war. So my hypothesis to you is that really great things come out of very significant hardship. And there is a tendency in the public sector when the going gets rough to say, let's just stay on an even keel, but not you know, keep the stability, don't change now. I would like to challenge that position. I think it's vital that we do. When, um, when I look at the drivers for change that are facing us now, I look at them in a slightly different order to the way many others do. The numero uno driver for change in our NHS, whether we like it or not, is economics. The second driver for change is information technology. People run their lives on their iPhones, on their computers, their social lives, their financial lives, their, uh, their holidays, um, their, their own checkout <coughs> clerks at, um, at uh, supermarkets. So technology is big, and we're going to see more of that, and interestingly, the innovation awards for uh, the best technology innovations uh, this year were in London last night. The third driver for change is a set of changing expectations at three different levels. First of all, the public continue to expect to get free care at the point of delivery, and they expect that care to be of high quality, and they expect it uh, to be available to everybody. A very noble set of expectations which everybody in this room will sign up to. The second set of expectations is for those who provide health care and who deliver the infrastructure for health care. They expect to be able to make a reasonable amount of money so that they can continue to run their operations, and corporates expect a reasonable return on investment so that they can continue with their R&D. And the third level of expectations come from governments around the world, all of whom expect good value for money for health care. And nowhere is that debate greater at the moment than it is in this country. And the final, expect, the, the final driver for change is demographics. There is a tendency for clinicians to put demographics at number one, but I put it to you, if we had enough money, we wouldn't need to worry about demographic change because we could deal with it. But we haven't got enough money, so we have to think of other ways of dealing with the increased demand associated with the dramatic demographic change. Now, successful companies, um, and I'm not an economist, so this is a, a sort of amateur perception, but successful companies in a, in a difficult fiscal environment, it seems to me, do three things. First of all, they take control of their finances. 
And I think in the NHS at the moment, we've got reasonable control of our finances and we have some headroom for the short term. The second thing that companies do is they ask their customers what they want. And the third thing they do is they innovate according to what their customers tell them. Because if they fail to do that, they go down. But most importantly, they do it with a degree of urgency. And I would invite you to reflect for a while on how well our NHS has asked the customers what they want and innovated accordingly. And to me, that's one of the great opportunities that a, um, uh, that a conference of this nature brings. So innovation, I want you to imagine. Imagine a country with the biggest integrated healthcare system in the world. Imagine a country that has a long history of medical innovation, that invented the thermometer, that invented the intraocular lens, that invented the electrocardiogram, that invented the, um, the basis for CT scanning and MRI scanning. Imagine a country with four of the top ten universities in the world. Imagine a country where the future of that integrated healthcare system depends on innovation. That country is our country. And I think we need to use that expertise, that long history that we have of innovation to address some powerful issues which are facing us today, which are utterly unavoidable. I've been to many conferences, several of them in this, uh, in this building, where people talk, they understand the problems, they think of some potential solutions, and they go home, waiting for the next conference the next year. We don't have that luxury now. So my challenge to Martin um, and to you is that this meeting should result in a product which can be delivered to us in NHS England which says these are the problems, these are the solutions, and this is how they should be implemented. It's that final bit that will make the difference. It's the product of this meeting. So there isn't another group of people in another room and some other part of London thinking about this. It's not them that's going to come up with this. So please, please help us, because I think the future of our NHS is at stake if we don't solve these problems. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Bruce. And um, I'll invite straight away, if I may, uh, Malcolm Grant to speak. Well, thank you very much, Fiona. And um, can I echo Bruce's comments about how delighted I am to be here and how important the conference is to our thinking at NHS England. For me, this has been a rather interesting week. On Monday night at midnight, I retired as president and provost of UCL after 10 years. And at midnight on Monday night, I moved more into an almost full-time role as, uh, as the chair of NHS England. That's not been a sharp move because over the past two years, we've been setting up NHS England and for the first 18 months we talked about processes and procedures and policies. We've got cupboards full of them, uh, sorry, internet pages full of them. And um, we've got ourselves, I think, pretty well set up as an organization. At the end of March this year, we had about 100 people on the payroll of NHS England. And on the 1st of April, we had 6,500 people. Uh, we had to house them, uh, feed them, provide IT facilities, telephones, premises, uh, and actually pay them at the end of the month. Now, that all sounds straightforward, but when they came from 162 different organizations with different record keeping uh, and different levels of accuracy, uh, you can understand some of the sheer administrative tension that's gone into creating a wholly new organization. Was it worth it? Well, as Mao Zedong once said of the French Revolution, it's still too early to tell. But I've got a fundamental belief that we've got something here that will work, but only if we run it properly. And by running it properly, I mean inverting the traditional rule of the NHS, which is that there is tight central control from Whitehall. There is a top-down imposition of targets and that people will uh, meet those targets or be punished. That's not the way in which you run 
uh, a mature and complex organization. This is an organization that has something like 300 million interactions a year, uh, in which patients are being seen uh, at a rate of about 1 million per 36 hours. Uh, it's an organization whose success depends entirely upon the morale and the commitment of those who provide the frontline services. And so our absolute commitment is to invert the traditional rule and to understand that the rule of running a successful organization is not uh, that the beatings will continue until morale improves, but that clinical leadership adjusted to local circumstances with innovation and with a knowledge of what is best in class in the world will produce the best result for patients. It takes me back to four years ago when we were conceiving the design of UCL Partners, uh, working with people like Cyril Chantler and David Fish and Robert Naylor and the other chief executives of some of the major hospitals in London. We tried to work out what was a model for drawing together the academic side of health uh, from basic research through to highly applied research and actually getting it into practice uh, in our major hospitals. Actually, there was another theme to it, which was equally fundamental today, and that was how do we break down the silos uh, between providers, between the hospitals and between the hospitals and, and primary care and the other providers of healthcare, including the voluntary sector. There were two models on the table. The one, which might be loosely called without a capital I, the imperial model, uh, which was the model in which university and um, uh, health science center would, would come together and run a unitary uh, operation. And we puzzled about that, but we decided that our model was better if it were a dispersed model uh, in which there was a strategic joinder between the institutions that actually got people to agree on what could be the wins uh, and what could be the sacrifice that one institution could make in order to advance the interests of the institutions as a whole in providing the highest quality of care for patients? And that has been the fundamental thinking behind UCL Partners. And I'm absolutely delighted that this conference today represents so much of that early thinking that went into the design. It's been a process which I think characterizes much of what we want to do at NHS England which is that it isn't high profile, it isn't swaggering, it isn't going around barking orders. It's actually doing all the work behind the scenes and developing the confidence and trust that we know we have to in order to deliver the highest quality healthcare system. So, we are this week also celebrating the first six months of NHS England. Uh, we have our six and a half thousand staff, but way beyond our staff has been the transformation of commissioning through clinical commissioning groups. The breakdown in terms of funding is that we are responsible uh, for the total NHS budget of uh, about 96 billion pounds. Uh, this, by the way, is equals the total GDP of my native country, New Zealand. Uh, and if I ever were having difficulty getting to sleep at night, that, that very thought uh, is bound to prevent it from occurring. Reading some of our policies has the other effect. But the... Um, <laughs> the, the uh, sorry, that was an unworthy comment, and I, <laughs> I, I retracted. But it does go back to Bruce's point that this isn't about policies. Yes, you've got to have the policies right, but this is about action. And we've got to stop just doing the policies and get on and do, do the business. So we've got, um, of that total budget, uh, we have committed 12 billion to specialised commissioning. And our major task there is to try and ensure that the postcode lottery uh, for specialised commissioning is a thing of the past. We have designed 140 specifications uh, for different clinical conditions for which there is now a single national approach across the whole country. It makes no difference to the future of your child born with a cleft palate, whether it was born in Devon or in Newcastle. Uh, the treatment will be uh, on a national basis. Uh, we also have the responsibility for commissioning primary care, including uh, GPs and the GP contract. But beyond that, we've allocated 55 billion uh, to 211 clinical commissioning groups. Now, what I wanted to stress this morning is I see CCGs as extraordinary agents for change across the NHS. Not all of them are anywhere near this yet, but those where experimentation is occurring, those where innovation is occurring, are getting a long way ahead of anything that we've been able to do in the past. Uh, they've been able to take the leadership which is given to them by virtue of having these uh, sums of money, 
to plan a strategy for their own area, to work closely with local government, to work closely with the third sector, and of course to work very closely uh, with the providers to try to ensure that the patient pathway for any particular condition isn't a product of the preferences of successive providers, or indeed successive consultants within successive providers, but is provided in a much more joined up way. We have uh, CCGs who are commissioning high quality informatics uh, so that they understand not only what are the demographic characteristics and the burden of disease in their local areas, uh, but also what treatments work and what provision is available and how it may be uh, enthusiastically joined up. This is, I think, becoming infectious. Uh, we've also got some first-rate hospitals who are experimenting uh, with a different pathway for patients which allows them, if they suffer from a long-term condition or more than one long-term condition, to have a one-stop shop. You come in, uh, you have a half day in the hospital in which there is a complete uh, analysis of the problem. The tests are done and the patient uh, is sent home with the results in an integrated care package that follows. Rather than a succession of visits to see successive consultants come back for successive tests, go back to see successive consultants and on it goes. For the reasons Bruce has mentioned, we cannot afford it. We cannot afford waste in the NHS. We have, over the past 65 years, seen an increase in demand for healthcare services in this country of around 5% per annum. We've also seen a funding increase of around 4% per annum ahead of inflation, and that's 4% real. The first of those increases, demand, will continue. The second, funding, will not. Nobody looking at the current state of the British economy could give me an assurance that I would believe that we will see above inflation funding for the NHS over the next five years, if not the next 10. Strategically, in response to that, we've got really three choices. One is we ration the provision of healthcare. The second is we introduce charging for aspects of healthcare. And the third is we actually make what we've got go further. And I couldn't support either of those first two approaches unless I was absolutely convinced that we had worked out the third, and I don't think we're anywhere near working out the third. I think that the impact of improving processes across the system, which we're perfectly capable of doing, but requires a very significant culture change, and it has to come by CCGs being representatives of patients in their area and using commissioning effectively, perhaps for the first time. And it has to come also by our not telling CCGs what to do, but supporting them and sustaining them and providing the infrastructure that does that. Thirdly, innovation. Bruce's theme on which he concluded and on which I will also conclude is fundamental. None of us, I think, can foresee what will be the disruptive technologies of the next five to 10 years that can help us to transform healthcare. Everybody in this room, I suspect, has a mobile phone in their pocket. If I had told you 10 years ago you'd be sitting here with not only a mobile phone but a mini computer tied in with it and a high resolution camera, I'd have been laughed at. Uh, I, I, there, there is an extraordinary capacity for technology now to be turned to the cause of healthcare and much work is being taken place in Silicon Valley and in this country. A second aspect of technology has to be our, our great universities. And this is where institutions like UCL Partners and the other new academic health science networks across the country come to the fore. We have to deploy the brain power in our universities to the cause. And these networks uh, which get not only the discovery from the laboratory to the bedside, but get it from the bedside to all bedsides. <laughs> We've got to overcome this dissemination diffusion gap uh, which currently exists in the NHS. We will do our part uh, as system leaders on this, but we are not system dictators. We will not prescribe what will happen. Our role is facilitation. Facilitation around data, facilitation around transparency. Bruce's initiative, for example, in ensuring that the outcomes of surgical interventions in 10 specialties are now published. It's possible now to, by consultant by consultant, to see what the outcomes are, not just in terms of mortality, but in terms of other indicators of success of the process. We have to lift the veil of secrecy. We have to lift the tradition uh, of introversion and cover-up, and we have to make this a vibrant ecosystem visible to the world. Through transparency, it's possible to drive improvements in performance across the whole system. 
and I can assure you that that is what NHS England is committed to. In conclusion, I would just like to read out some words from the recent report by Don Berwick, the, the great American healthcare expert who was brought in to advise the government in the wake of the Midstaff's scandal. He wrote, you are stewards of a globally important treasure, the NHS. In its form and mission, guided by the unwavering charter of universal care, accessible to all and free at the point of service, the NHS is a unique example for all to learn from and emulate. Faults are to be expected in any enterprise of such size and ambition. And as you know, the nation's leaders have the dual duty to continually, unblinkingly recognize and reduce those faults, and at the same time to maintain and build confidence in the grand vision of the NHS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Bruce. So we have something um, globally unique, very special for the world, but also incredibly important for us all in the UK. Um, we have to make what we've got go further. There isn't another group of people somewhere else in another room, I think that's a very important thing to remember, who are going to sort out the challenges we face. Uh, this isn't going to happen top down. It's going to be clinical leadership adjusted to local circumstances. Uh, innovation in technology, data, transparency, um, and we have until the end of the day to <laughs> tell Bruce and Malcolm what are the problems, what are the solutions, how are they implemented, or let's say at the very least to come up with some ideas about how we're going to get to the problem solutions and how to implement them. So there's the challenge. I'm going to first hand over to Olivia Butterworth, who has the wonderful title of Head of Public Voice, NHS England, who's going to just get some thoughts from our people pa people's panel, and then we'll open it up more broadly. Olivia. Um, Working? Yes. Malcolm, please tell me you've read the participation guidance that we published last week. It's fantastic. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. you have. It's beautiful, it's interactive, and the beautiful Lynn Craven's there Has on the front. everybody else read it? <laughs> Um, and we've got people in there talking. You can watch, we can watch videos through it as well, so it's not all words. So we're trying to do it differently. <laughs> Lynn. Hello. I was just sitting here, and it's just dawned on me that we've done lots of talking, and we're going to build this wonderful house of care, and we're going to have patients as architects, and architects can be trained to help you at all stages. And we're calling it the future of health. Tomorrow, can we just call it health today? Because the future of health starts tomorrow. Please? I've been waiting for 10 years. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm particularly interested in what uh, Sir Bruce said and also tying it in to something Martin said. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I have um, lived with a long-term condition for more than 30 years. And I've also been a stockbroker for 20 years. Sorry to confess that. <laughs> Stockbrokers, in a nutshell, look at thousands and thousands and thousands of companies over their years in the profession. They work out what works. And I like the idea that you were drawing from uh, the corporate world. My understanding of that is that the corporate world operates to some degree almost exclusively in response to the market and the market is people and if you look at the product development cycle and the innovation cycle often the people the consumers whatever phrase you like are involved not just at the end of the cycle <coughs> the product innovation cycle excuse me but right at the start when you're actually thinking, what is the product I want to sell? Mm. Now, Martin's talked about co-production, which, to my mind, is very different from patient involvement. So I guess it's been fantastic to hear the pledges and the discussions that have been going on today um, so far. But my question is, how do we do that? Co-production is different to patient involvement. And it starts well before you begin to think about what the services you want or what facilitation role you have to bring out the best 
in the healthcare service. How do we take co-production in NHS England to another level where it infuses the ethos of the organization? And within, I believe, within a short number of years, you'd see the difference. And my last follow-through, sorry, a long question. Um, so, Malcolm, I think you talked about waste almost being a cardinal sin. Well, there are 17 million people, 15, 17, with long-term conditions. For me, the um, opportunity loss from not involving those individuals in co-design is the greatest loss of all, or the greatest waste of all. Sorry, there are a few questions in there. But. Um, so can I suggest, um, Bruce, the, the one about bringing people in right from the very start, and how do we, you know, if you're designing a product, you'd do that, why don't we do that more? How could we do it more? That, I think you've got, a, you've got one. Oh, it's not working. Not working. <laughs> um, that's what I was trying to allude to in the brief remark about asking customers what they want. And there are many layers to that. So we've tried to make some steps, and I don't pretend for one moment we've got it right. But NHS England um, does three things, really. First of all, it commissions um, specialized, highly specialized services, and we do that directly from provider organizations. Secondly, we commission primary care. And thirdly, as Malcolm pointed out, we we're facilitators to help CCGs do what they know needs to be done uh, at a local level. In terms of the specialized commissioning, the first steps we've made on this, which have never been attempted before in this country, is we have 75 groups of clinicians and patients working in specified um, diagnostic or therapeutic areas to advise on this. Um, and we're in the foothills of how we do that. And I think by selecting the right members of the public to sit on those groups, we will get uh, further advice on how to move that forward. The, the second area, which is more complex, and I think Martin might will be in a better position to, to advise on this, is how we encourage CCGs to really get patients in right at the beginning of the problem. And not just patients, actually, members of the public. Uh, so I'll pass over to, to Martin on that. I'll, I'll follow that. Thank you. So um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think one of the things that Malcolm mentioned is about the new dynamic with clinical commissioning groups. So um, uh, my background is having um, uh, uh, worked as a GP in a local community, but then getting involved in um, uh, fund holding and then primary care groups and so on. And what I found was that um, where, where, th where we actually had a feeling of ownership locally, we could engage much more purposefully with uh, patient groups, uh, with the local community to really understand and get that insight and drive change which was supported. I'm, and I've done quite a lot of this over the last few years. Um, and I've made one or two mistakes as well and learned from them. Um, so I think, I think your point is, is absolutely right. I also think the other thing we haven't mentioned is local authorities and health and wellbeing boards. And um, uh, this, is, this is more than the NHS. As someone said to me recently, this is more than medicine. It is about communities and how we work, and Jeremy Hughes was here yesterday talking about Alzheimer friends and Alzheimer communities. How do we work and engage locally? I don't think that can be done in Whitehall. I don't think it can be done in, in, in Quarry House. But I think when I've been to you know, um, uh, Leeds, uh, uh, Newark, uh, Basildon, uh, Birmingham, place. You, you feel that sense of energy and we've got an opportunity to truly engage and work with, our local, with local people to create services that have meaning for this part of the country. Let me just give one example. I was um, told yesterday of um, an action that had been taken by a CCG, and this is by a, a GP who 
CCG leader who had wanted to work out whether they were doing the right thing for alcoholics. Uh, and so they got a half-day meeting of alcoholics, recovering alcoholics and, and several who were still drinking and, and, and members of their family. A long discussion ensued, and at the end of that, she said, she felt that our arrangements for dealing with alcoholics were almost entirely wrong in every respect. Uh, and we, listening to that meeting, uh, really had to commit ourselves to taking a, a completely fresh approach. And uh, I think that illustrates very well the point that's been made. Thanks, Michael. At the risk of overrunning, I'd just like to invite um, people generally to raise hands. I'm going to take three or four brief, if they may be, comments. There's a lady there. Um, there's a gentleman here. There's um, anyone over here with a hand up. Um, there's a lady at the front. So if I do, maybe if any, any other desperate hands waving. So we're going to go one, two, three. Thank you. Brief, if you may. If yes, you will. I'm Rachel Butler. I'm from the London region of NHS England. And I think my comment really is, uh, my question is for you. So... Um, there's a lot of energy going into the listening to patients, but I think there's also something that's coming through, and it came in through, through your comment, about how, how nimble, how responsive, how urgently can we respond. And I was fortunate to go to visit to Vodafone um, this week as part of an NHS England visit to understand how a company has really reformed its ability to be responsive. And they had a completely different way of organizing themselves, of drawing in staff, of being highly responsive. And I guess I'm interested in your reflections on where are the companies that really move fast in response to what they hear from their customers? Thank you very much. Um, I can't remember where the other hand was, that it was just here. Sorry. And then there was... I'll run. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the lady at the front there. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure that's working, is that... Uh, it's been Bruce Pollington, I'm a medical director for hospice in Kent. Um, my question is about how do we support um, commissioners to, to innovate? Um, we want to have secure finances, but innovation, you don't have, really have the evidence. So how do we, how do we crack that cycle? Um, frivolous example, let's suggest we wanted to put Google glasses on ambulance crews so you could have a multidisciplinary scene, team, view patients at the roadside or or in, in, in someone's home. Sounds like a great idea, um, if public were behind that. How would we actually, how, how do you commission that when we've got no evidence? How Thank do you generate the evidence for genuinely new good ideas and new technology which is available? Thank you, and the lady behind you, and I'm just feeling generous to the man behind you there. Um, <laughs> if you want to pass the microphone that way, diagonally backwards. Thank you, um, my name's Angie Archer. I'm uh, on the patient, uh, the people's panel, um, but also, um, Self Management UK, and um, as as part of that um, position, we rely on innovative commissioners to take the plunge to say, okay, we'd like our people to learn how to self manage their conditions because ultimately it's going to save NHS money, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and gives people empowerment. Um, but my question is, it, I'm loving hearing what, the commitment everybody's making, and 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 to me, it's really refreshing. Um, but what I'd like to know is how is all of this going to get filtered down onto kind of the front line, basically? Because I've done some work before on communication training with GPs um, that have been retired and come back and that kind of thing. And really, quite honestly, it, it's something that needs to be looked at. And it needs, you know, just simple questions like, what would you like to get out of today's visit rather than, you know, how are you feeling today? Which is a ridiculous question when you go to doctors. So how to make it real in practice. Yes. Thank you. And at the back. Uh, yeah. I'm Tim Bents from Routine Health Outcomes. Uh, uh, for Bruce Keogh, really, uh, Jim Collins in Good to Great said that great companies focus on key performance indicators and pursue those resolutely. We've introduced the friends and family test, but we still don't have a good measure of value which applies to all patients, irrespective of how many things are the matter with them. Brilliant. Right, in about um, the last less than two, two, two minutes, um, you have the choice, Bruce, of how to learn from best companies, um, how to help commissioners to innovate, how to filter all of this down to the very frontline individual patient doctor intervention, and how do we measure value? Go. <laughs> without repeating myself, um, the, the two questions about commissioning I think are similar. So I don't think we should commission, in a sense, for innovation. We need to give the freedom to allow people to innovate. 
and we need to give people the freedom to take risk and we need to give people the freedom to fail when they innovate. So it gets back to Malcolm's point about we can't be dictators. Um, it comes to Martin's point is people sitting in Whitehall or Quarry House don't know what the best innovations are. The innovations need to come fr from the freedoms that we give to people and the encouragement that we give them. In, t in terms of value, yeah, that was just one question too many. I don't have... I don't have a clear answer for that, but the key performance indicators are absolutely right. But we need to get the right key performance indicators, and they need to relate specifically to, um, in my view, um, outcomes within the three domains of quality and the amount of money spent. Um, and we're making progress on the measurement of that, uh, but we've got a long way to go. Thanks, Bruce. Malcolm. No, I don't think I have anything to add to that, except um, I've still been pondering that question about waste. Uh, I mean, I, I think our responsibility is just to make sure that every pound we invest in the health service goes to the best outcomes for patients. And um, if there are abilities to reach out to understanding new ways of doing things and new patients' preferences, then that's a fundamental part of that overall exercise. It's best value for money uh, on behalf of patients and taxpayers. Martin. So, very briefly, I think what we need to do is to differentiate between doing things better and doing things differently. So, a lot of waste can be eliminated by doing the right thing that we know and is evidence-based, but we also need to drive innovation by doing things differently. I think the other point is, that we, just to echo, we need to get the measurements right. So, the one thing that struck me is that uh, research measurement is good in research. It's not that helpful sometimes in the messy, complex world that uh, clinicians and people receiving treatment have. Measurement for judgment is probably important but can be overdone. And what I think we lack is measurement for improvement and how we actually learn the culture of measurement for improvement in the NHS, which supports real, dynamic, continuous improvement for the people we serve. Thank you very much. We're out of time. An enormous challenge. No one else is going to deliver it. It's got to come from people in this room. Best of luck with that. The BMJ will be watching, commenting. If we can do stuff in the journal that will help, please let me know. Have a great day. Many thanks to our speakers, and see you soon. Thank you.